Hi, everyone. Welcome in. Um, we're just going to um, let the room fill virtually real quick um, and make sure folks audio and video work. Um, if we're going to be speaking with you, I'm seeing a lot of our cohort on the call, which is awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, and just click through here. Um, Andrea Bell, if you can hear me, please let me know. And then Deb DeSantis, if you're on, please let me know. We just want to make sure your guys' audio and video is good. And then we'll go ahead and get started. I think Deb is just now joining, so. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Amber. All right, I see that we have 64 folks in the room. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm seeing some familiar names, so that's super exciting, past and present. So thank you for being here. Um, Deb DeSantis, real quick, are you online? And can you just like say hey to me so we feel good about the audio video? Awesome. Hi, Deb, <laughs> thanks for being here. And then Andrea Bell, same thing. Andrea might be hopping on when she is scheduled. Awesome. Okay. So Andrea, um, uh, we just want to make sure your audio video is good. So if you need anything, please contact Amber. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. So let me just make sure my screen looks right here. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we're so excited to see everybody here. Uh, we have, like I said, about 70 folks in the room. We might expect more. So thank you for being here. Thank you for showing interest in supportive housing. We're super excited to celebrate the cohort today, catch you guys up to speed on what supportive housing is, who the players are, um, and then really just pass the mic right to these awesome projects throughout Oregon who are um, working to house um, chronically homeless populations. So um, again, um, hopefully you're in the right place, Oregon Supportive Housing Institute 2022 Project Reveal. This is our third annual Supportive Housing Institute, which is really exciting. And we're, we're highlighting nine project teams or eight who can be present today. So we're excited to hear from them. Um, I'm gonna let you know a little bit about CSH. Um, my name is Ray Trotta. I use they, them pronouns. I do work at CSH and I'm um, working today with my colleague, Amber Bunig, um, who has made the Oregon Institute possible this year. So Amber, thank you so much for all that you do. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm excited to be working with you today on um, highlighting these projects and letting folks know about what's going on in Oregon. Um, you can go ahead and, and, and switch the slide. So CSH, who's CSH? Um, CSH is a national nonprofit, stands for Corporation for Supportive Housing. Uh, we're headquartered in New York, but we have regional offices and staff throughout the country. We focus on supportive housing and housing solutions to improve the lives of vulnerable people. We also help communities maximize their public resources through creating supportive housing. And our ultimate goal is to build strong and healthy communities can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the run of show today, um, I'm gonna start with some level setting. Again, what is supportive housing? If you don't know, we will let you know and then the teams will show us. Um, so that's exciting today. Um, and what role does CSH play with this supportive housing institute here in Oregon and nationwide? We'll hear from CSH president, Deb DeSantis. Deb, thank you again for being here. I'm so glad you can join us um, to share with us um, your appreciation of all the hard work being done in Oregon to house and support our chronically homeless populations and celebrate this team, which again is why we're, why we're here. Um, Deb will be followed by a video from our CSH Speak Up program to share some of the advocacy ha efforts happening on the ground and again answer that question of like, what is supportive housing from the tenant's uh, perspective? Next up, we'll pass the mic to Andrea Bell, um, Executive Director of Oregon Housing and Community Services, OHCS. OHCS funds this institute um, and sustains so much energy and investment for supportive housing in all corners of the state. 
My colleagues at OHCS are great. So thank you so much, guys. Dana Schultz um, and Amy Cole, you are both awesome to work with. And this is the third year I get to say that. Um, and I think my, my vibe hasn't changed. You guys are awesome to work with. So thank you. You really make this uh, project fun. Um, we feel uh, connected to you and connected to this effort throughout the state. So thank you for bringing that to the table. Um, you guys are collaborative and dedicated to resourcing and building capacity for PSH statewide. So it's a really a perfect partnership with CSH. Um, thank you for trusting us to support this institute through the training and technical assistance that we provide. And after, after uh, we hear from OHS, yes, we will have a special guest greeting and I'm gonna leave it at that. It's gonna be a special guest so we can all enjoy this, the surprise together. Um, to the 2022 cohort, the folks you'll be hearing from today, congratulations and thank you. Um, this special guest is really speaking to you guys. Um, you are doing the hard work, right? And have shown the dedication, focus and collaboration it takes to make things happen. So before we move on to hearing from the cohort to reveal, the, reveal their final project presentations, you'll get to hear from a few of our cohort participants who answered the question, why do they want PSH in, in their community? Um, so that will conclude kind of the celebration part of today, and then we'll hand the mic to the teams. Uh, each team will present, followed by some questions. We will be taking questions in the chat, and Amber will be moderating that portion and let you know how to do that during the presentation. We welcome audience questions, um, and we get and we're excited to delve into these projects. And that is it. Any other logistical pieces, Amber, that I missed that anyone should know about uh, to follow along today? I think that sums it up. I uh, just want to reiterate to definitely use the chat feature um, for questions and everybody should be able to unmute themselves. So if you do feel strongly about coming off of mute to ask a question, um, that's available, but otherwise, we do ask you to stay on mute um, so that uh, when we get to the project presentation aspects, we can hear um, our lovely teams. Um, and if you could keep your video off, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have the teams put their videos on so you can see their lovely faces. Um, but otherwise, if you could keep videos off, that would be helpful as well. Awesome, thanks so much, Amber. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so so again, the crux of why we're here, what is supportive housing? So supportive housing is deeply affordable with a mix of services that are designed to help tenants be successful in their housing, improve their health outcomes, increase income, and engage in meaningful activities. So what's important to keep in mind is that supportive housing is not for every individual or family who experiences housing instability. It's an intervention designed to meet the needs of individuals and families with complex health and social needs. So supportive housing is for individuals who would not maintain housing without services and without services would not maintain housing. So it's a bit, bit of a tongue twister, I'll say it again. Supportive housing is for individuals who would not maintain housing without services, and then without those services, likely would not be able to maintain that housing. Next slide, please. So our nine project teams in the 2022 Supportive Housing Institute represent seven Oregon counties this year, Clatsop, Multnomah, Marion, Lincoln, Benton, and Lane. And a few fun facts about this Oregon Supportive Housing Institute. In this cohort, we have our first two Oregon Institute teams serving transition age youth. So thank you to you guys for pioneering in this space. We're very excited uh, to see supportive housing for transition age youth um, and youth experiencing homelessness and housing and in our state. So super excited to be with you guys and hear from you today. There are multiple veteran projects in this institute, uh, multiple rural projects, which are always excited to represent, um, and projects serving Black and LGBTQIA2 Spirit Plus communities. So thank you guys again for everything you do, and I can't wait to hear from you. Next slide, please. So what is the Supportive Housing Institute? So like I said, CSH is a national organization. The Supportive Housing Institute happens in many uh, states and, and localities uh, throughout the country. And here in Oregon, like I said, we're on our third round. Um, project teams in this institute are represented by services, property management, 
development and lived expertise, which is super cool and uh, what we love to see um, bringing community together in our projects. So graduate organizations in this cohort include culturally specific, housing authorities, community action agencies, mission-driven property management, development partners, behavioral health, recovery, and other community-based co coalitions. Um, so when I was first introduced to, to the Supportive Housing Institute by my colleagues at CSH, um, one of the most astute um, pieces of advice I received was that the Institute is a training effort, but really it's a community building effort, right? We walk alongside you guys in this process, and you really do the hard work of sitting together at a table that you maybe haven't done before, right? So in other areas of housing and other areas of services, we can sometimes stay separate a little bit, right? Development's development, property management is property management and services is services. In the Institute, we somewhat force you to sit at the same table, which uh, is kind of funny because by the end of the day, we see what that forced uh, interaction does, which really makes for some thoughtful planning and real community effort in putting these projects together. So I'm going to let the teams demonstrate that today. But again, thank you guys for your dedication. You've spent five months on these different topics. Um, again, some of it has been new to certain parties at the table, again, given that not everyone always gets training on all aspects of what supportive housing is. So we're excited to hear again from the teams um, and, um, and, and uh, celebrate their successes. Next slide, please. So once again, shout out to OHDS who provided us with these overview slides of our last three years of work together, which is really cool to think back on. So since 2019, we've seen 27 projects go through the Institute, which feels like a really big deal because I can remember when we started this Institute uh, with our first 10. So we have 27 graduates, including those today, um, 10 graduated in 2020, eight in 2021 and nine today. Um, we've had diverse st statewide representation as you can see from almost every geography in Oregon, including projects from Central Oregon, one in Bend, one in Warm Springs, coastal regions, Astoria, Coos Bay, North Bend, Lido, Corvallis, Eastern Oregon, including Lakeview and Ontario, Eugene, Portland, Greater Portland metro area, uh, Gladstone, Happy Valley, Newburgh, Tualatin, Tigard, Salem, two projects in Salem, and Southern Oregon in Roseburg and the Medford Grants Pass area. Next slide, please. So to date, uh, the Oregon Supportive Housing Institute uh, using OHCS funds has supported the development of more than 558 new PSH units across the state of Oregon which is really great stuff in three years, I just wanna say. So um, again, OHCS put this slide together for us. Y'all can digest it a little bit, but I'll give some highlights. Um, we have, uh, well, I don't have, but OHCS has funded, um, secured funding for uh, 16 of these projects. Um, and four projects are currently open and operating PSH, permanent supportive housing in their communities. So we have them named up on the screen here. Um, and if any of you are in attendance today, um, congrats, um, and we're, we're really excited to watch your progress. And we have two more projects uh, who will open by the end of 2022. Next slide, please. So this one's an overview. Hopefully you guys can see a little bit of it. Just if you're curious about um, who has secured funding and where they're located, this one highlights that. And this uh, information is also publicly available so we can follow up later on if you wanna dive into any of the projects who have secured funding. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it to um, our director here at CSH, uh, Deb DeSantis. Deb, thank you again for being with us today. I'm excited to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Uh, and thank you everyone for allowing me to be part of your celebration. Um, it's really quite selfish on, on my part. Uh, I wanted to be here today to uh, extend congratulations to all of you. And thank you uh, on behalf of CSH uh, for allowing us to learn along with you. Uh, and to support your efforts to advance supportive housing opportunities. Um, I do want to extend a special thanks to Governor Brown uh, and to the leadership at OHCS uh, for uh, their commitment to making sure that uh, not only 
Uh, do you have goals in place uh, for creating supportive housing uh, across the state of Oregon, uh, but also uh, providing the tools and resources to make sure uh, that that vision becomes a reality? Um, I also wanted to convey to all of you, because I've had the, the good fortune to participate in a number of supportive housing institutes across the country. Uh, and um, uh, I wanted to make sure that you come away from this experience understanding how special you are uh, and how important uh, the work is and how you have been a huge part of informing the supportive housing field. Um, as Ray walked through the different projects and the different geographies and the different populations who will benefit from the housing you will create. Um, I want you to know that um, you really have um, created uh, knowledge for the field. Um, you know, there are many communities that say we can't get it done in rural communities. There are many communities that say we can't target a certain population. Um, and, and what you have done is uh, shown the rest of us that actually it can be done. So I want to applaud you all. I know, I know um, it's a lot to ask of all of you to set aside time, right, uh, over five months to come together as a team uh, and be part of this experience. Uh, so thank you uh, for, for making this a priority among all the other things that, that you have uh, to get done. Um, and um, I want uh, to just emphasize what, what Ray said about building community. Um, I hope you have a sense of, of just how you have uh, built community, not just among your team, but also with your colleagues and other organizations. And, and I hope that you will carry that sense of uh, community forward uh, as, you, uh, as you work to advance these specific projects, um, but also as you work to advance creating additional supportive housing, because I've got to believe this is not a one-off uh, opportunity for for any of you. Uh, and I really look forward um, to hearing about the continued progress that you all make to reach your own organizational goals uh, and to achieve the goals that Oregon has, has set forth. Um, and, and let me just say that in closing, um, I think it's also important to note um, how you all have made a priority of valuing those with lived experience, um, not only in uh, making sure that they're uh, informing your work, but that they're part of your work. Um, and I think that we're all learning or have learned the importance of making sure that our work reflects the true community needs and the way that we know what those needs are make, is by making sure that folks that are experiencing the systems, that folks that are experiencing housing security are part of the conversations and part of the work. So thank you uh, for showing the rest of us how that is done. Uh, and on that note, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce a community advocate, Harvey, uh, and um, Harvey is going to share his story through a video. Uh, and I think uh, Harvey's emphasis on it's not just housing, it's housing with supports, um, I think is, is a really important takeaway for all of us. So again, congratulations. Um, thank you for letting us be part of your journey. Um, and uh, I really hope that you all take the time to celebrate your success. Thank you. Just a little bit about me. I, um, I experienced homeless over the last 30 years on and off. So I became a chronic person with homelessness. Yeah. Learned that I needed some help and got some help. And uh, now I'm uh, actually uh, a drug counselor and a state advocate which led me to be here in Sacramento, California to come to the state capitol and uh, speaker for uh, be advocacy for those of us that are homeless. And I've done it through uh, CSH where 
they allow me and train me and then allow me to come and do what I'm doing right now and just advocate for those of us that need housing. And we need housing first, but we don't need just housing, but we need housing with support. Because obviously if we've been homeless for a period of time, we have other issues going on other than just not uh, having houses. And so having housing with support and letting the, the people down there know that and what it means for those of us to have that type of support is totally awesome. That you can live in a building and then if there's some things going on that you're not quite right or know how to do, you have case managers and those that can assist you. And that way we stay housed and you don't have to rehouse those you have housed. And so the best thing I would like to ask anyone, anyone that knows is helping with housing, please give us housing with support, support of housing. And uh, remember, the house, it always, always starts with the home first. Because once it's home, then you can find out where actually what the needs are, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, or it's a combination of both. Um, then we can receive the help, and then we can keep that person or a person like myself housed. Thank you. Just a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. Uh, Andrea Bell. Oh, yes, I'll pass it to you. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Ray. And thank you, Amber. And just good morning, everybody. And, you know, there's, um, I know we have a collective group here today, all sort of focused on our shared values and our shared commitment. So whether your CSH or legislative or staff, uh, project teams, team OHCS, I want to just acknowledge and appreciate the collectiveness that we have here in this space. I am um, as I was listening to Harvey, I just want us to hold and to elevate uh, both Harvey, I think the experiences, the lived experience, lived expertise, and uh, the understanding of what he sort of uplifted, which is um, housing first doesn't mean housing only. And so it is that critical nature, that critical inter intersection of housing and services. Mm -hmm. Um, I will be brief in my comments because I could be here all day talking about PSH as somebody that was a service provider in another life that has worked deep, uh, deeply in permanent supportive housing. I could be here all day and there's so much robust conversation to get into. So I will be, I will be brief, but I want to start by just acknowledging I'm so thankful to be here. I'm so grateful to be in, uh, in your presence today to really both learn and to uplift the work that you have done in developing these projects. Um, I believe that in this space today, it represents our shared values, our shared values uh, of community building, which you heard a little bit about today, our shared values of our commitment to our beloved communities, and the reality that us here today is a signal, a manifestation that we do not accept homelessness as a fact of life. We reject that premise that homelessness does not have to be a fact of life. And we know that uh, so many of these projects, it's just the beginning and we, I just wanna extend our commitment, our shared commitment as Ray mentioned, to be with you as partners in this collective work with collective responsibility to be with you step-by-step step, uh, through this. I also wanna acknowledge that even getting to this point, I know that there is so much sweat equity, so much laboring of love, so many hard conversations probably in your community that you have to have just to garner support to get to this point. And oftentimes we talk about resources as the primary and resources are needed, more money is absolutely needed. We also know that money alone doesn't always change hearts and minds and perspectives. It is really being in community, having those conversations, finding common value, being able to recognize that when we talk about community building and resiliency and thriving communities, that is where all of us thrive, not just a portion of us. And so I want to just acknowledge all of you for I know probably having to have difficult conversations in your community, maybe even to this point, to get to a place where you can engage in this work and realize uh, permanent supportive housing in your community. Now, earlier last month, we had the pleasure of announcing a really important milestone. And I say milestone instead of goal because goal sort of signifies for me that we've ended and we've, we are far from over, but a really important milestone. 
uh, that we have surpassed our, our, our vision of creating a thousand permanent supportive uh, homes in which we've exceeded that. I wanna acknowledge, and I think it's important, particularly as a state agency, as a government agency to, to specifically articulate that that success is shared success. That is not because of OHCS independently and alone. That is because of the collective galvanization of you folks, of your teams, the previous cohorts, and all of the collective work that is happening in the community to make that happen. And I wanna make sure that that comes across uh, clear, recognizing that success, any success that we have is shared success. Now, I know that there was a question that was posed around why do you want PSH in your uh, community? And don't worry, I'm not gonna like go around and hear from, from, from each person. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to dig in that. I also wanna acknowledge that uh, permanent supportive housing, affordable housing more broadly, I think particularly in this moment in time plays a really critical role. I think it plays a really critical role in serving as a bridge for some of the broader social issues that we are facing as a state and as a nation and going towards those hard, difficult, but very necessary conversations. And so just to give you just to, you know, here at OHCS, we try to keep it 100 and open conversation because we don't believe there should be much space between us and our partners. You know, over the last couple of years, we have had some of the most challenging years, and we know that many individuals and families have experienced that as well. Um, but in administering uh, one of our first direct service programs, there was a lot of learning, a lot of challenges that came that came with that. But one of the most important, probably one of the most foundational, and this is something we talk to our Housing Stability Council about quite often, is the importance and the responsibility that we hold, that I hold, uh, in using our platform, using our funding to be intentional and inclusive, uh, to take calculated risks on new ways of doing things, and to be very explicit about centering racial justice and equity that we will not, we will not posture as an agency that cares about and centers racial justice and equity. We are a, a continuous learner in that and we acknowledge that. And at the same time, we wanna be very clear about our goal of pursuing and advancing racial justice and equity. And we don't have to choose one community or the other. This is about a collectiveness. When we all thrive, um, there is an economic benefit to that. There is a benefit to our community in that. And we've also walked the pathway so many years of what happens when we don't center racial justice and equity, when we don't seek to understand the needs of others. It requires us to get outside of our own frame of reference. And permanent supportive housing, the work that you are doing is a manifestation of that. It is a model of that. It is what gives hope. And so I wanna just leave us with that today. You know, As I was listening to uh, Ray at the top kind of talk about the projects that we have, we heard about urban projects, heard about coastal projects, rural projects, projects serving veterans, projects serving LGBTQ plus community, serving our black and brown community. That is representative of our community and that should never be a shocker. We should always seek to be, um, not only inclusive in our work, but recognizing that is what justice is. And we know that if old ways of doing business can inflict harm, imagine what we could do in an environment when we intentionally go towards healing. That is what this is. And it is important to recognize it every single moment of every single day, especially on the hardest, hardest days that we know we've had in the past and may still be ahead of us. But collectively, this is our shared values. These projects here today aren't picking one community. It's not about serving one portion of the state or serving uh, some portion of people. It's about the collectiveness. That is what our work is. That is what hope is. That is what hope kinetic is. And that is what our pursuit requires in rejecting homelessness as a fact of life. That is what this is. And so I just wanna say from me, from here of us, uh, all of us here at uh, uh, Oregon Housing and Community Services, you are what gives us hope. This is what gives us hope. Um, and so we hope that in those moments of hard days and hard moments that we can hold on to that and find our solace uh, in that together. 
So thank you for letting us be a part of it. Thank you for all of the work seen and unseen. We, we, we appreciate you and we know that uh, that is a, uh, we know that that is a large effort and undertaking. So uh, with that, I will yield back. Thanks for making some time for me and for us today. And then um, why don't we queue up our uh, special remarks that we have from our, our, our guests. So thanks everybody. Hello everyone, I'm Governor Kate Brown and just delighted to be part of today's celebration. First, let me congratulate all of the amazing project teams who are completing this year's Oregon Supportive Housing Institute today. I am so grateful for your work to create more permanent supportive housing in our Oregon communities. Your work is critical in helping our neighbors which are experiencing chronic homelessness to return to safe, stable, affordable housing. This year's projects are especially important in helping close the disparity gap for several populations who are most disproportionately impacted by homelessness, our veterans, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, young people transitioning out of foster care, and our LGBTQIA2S plus community. Each of your teams is part of a growing cohort of Oregon Supportive Housing Institute participants. I also want to acknowledge the past project teams who helped get us here today. These projects are years in the making. I've been so proud to see some of your predecessors' projects opening their doors recently. I also want to offer my appreciation to the amazing teams at OHCS and OHA who work closely with our behavioral health partners and community-based organizations to fit all the pieces of the puzzle together. Their work helps create and sustain permanent supportive housing homes for the long haul. And thank you too for the expert guidance from our partners at CSH who helped make this institute possible. Together, we across the state have helped Oregon recently surpass our five-year goal to fund more than a thousand permanent supportive homes. That's awesome. Congratulations on this huge achievement. Here's to a thousand more and beyond as we work to ensure all Oregonians have a safe, warm, affordable, and accessible place to call home. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. That was uh, perfect. Um, and thank you, uh, Governor Brown and team uh, for, for chiming in today and supporting our cohort. Um, we did ask our, our, our participants in the cohort to answer this question, why do you want PSH in your community? And our uh, colleagues at OHCS uh, were able to put together this little video. So we'll play that and then we'll go ahead and, and hear from these teams that we've, uh, we've prepped you for. We don't just want permanent supportive housing in our community. We need permanent supportive housing. We need it because young people deserve permanence of safety and home. We need it because young people can prevent a lifetime of the trauma of living homeless. We need it because it's equitable and fair. Why do we want to see permanent supportive housing in our communities? To help address the chronic and ongoing debilitating crises playing transition age youth. These are included, but just a short list, which would be sex exploitation, mental health crises, and other forms of debilitating traumas that hurt our youth's chances at living a regular life. All you have to do is look outside and see why we need permanent supported housing in Portland, but we need it specifically for young people. As someone who used to work in the family system, I've seen several young people that served as kiddos 
experiencing generational poverty and homelessness now entering the youth system and experiencing houselessness on their own. Um, these folks definitely deserve permanent housing and we need it specifically for young people. And to end, I would say that we know that permanent supportive housing and ending homelessness is the right thing to do. But for folks that might not believe that that's the right thing to do, it's also the fiscally responsible and data driven way to do things. We know that it saves money to permanently house folks. And we know that people will succeed um, once they have a permanent place to call home. Hello everyone, my name is Katie DeSantis. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I work with Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, also known as PCRI. And we are building a 40 unit permanent supportive housing complex in Northeast Portland. I want permanent supportive housing in my community because as someone who has lived experience of homelessness for my entire childhood, all the way until my early 20s. I know how important supportive housing is when supporting folks that are coming out of homelessness. Simply getting somewhere to lay your head is the first step, then everything else comes after it, including how do you sustain that housing? How do you mentally recover? from being homeless and the trauma you may have experienced, and how do you live and thrive? Permanent supportive housing is so important for our community because everyone deserves a chance to thrive in the way that they see fit. And housing is everyone's business. Thank you and have a great day. The main reason I'm supportive, supportive housing is I've seen that housing is not enough by itself, especially in low income areas. People tend to lose their housing due to their friends. I've seen people drink themselves to death. And I think without any additional support, it turns into chaos. Hello, my name is Jeremy Jostan of Team Kafori Court in Portland. I use he, him pronouns and work with Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, also known as PCRI. Why do I want permanent supportive housing in my community? Housing provides the stability families and individuals need to help make significant changes in their lives. Work, community, and social activities, as well as daily life, all revolve around where we live and the environments in which we live. By creating safe spaces through permanent supportive housing and coordinating client-centered services, we're helping make it easier for people to find out who they are and what they can accomplish. The rewards residents experience are a constant reminder of the good in humanity. Supportive housing is important to me because everybody deserves a safe place to live and the help that they need to be stable in housing. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. And thank you again to OHCS for putting that together. And thank you for all the participants who shared with us um, those thoughts. So without further ado, here we are. We made it. Yeah. Um, Amber, I'm going to pass it to you to, uh, to highlight our awesome teams. Great. Thanks, Ray. And thanks, everybody, for all the congratulations. These teams really have worked um, really hard the last five months. And I am really proud of them and really excited to have them present their projects. So first up, we have the Bethanias. Um, I'll give them a chance to get on camera um, and you guys can start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. 
Hi, everyone. We are the Bethenias, named after Dr. Bethenia Owens Adair, a person who overcame insurmountable obstacles to become a social reformer and one of Oregon's first women doctors with a medical degree. Dr. Owens Adair practiced medicine in Clatsop County and the existing Owens Adair building, and the new building celebrates her in its name. Our team includes me, Nina Reed, board chair of Northwest Oregon Housing Authority, Chantel Tucker, NOAA's property manager, Viviana Matthews, executive director of Clatsop County Community Action, who will provide the services for the project, and Wendy Klein, our development consultant from Community Development Partners. Owens Tube provides an opportunity for NOAA to turn an underutilized parking lot adjacent to the existing Owens Adair into 50 deeply affordable apartments for an aging population, many of whom have disabilities. NOAA currently owns and operates the Owens Adair, which includes 46 units of extremely low income housing for seniors and a parking lot on the other half of the lot. NOAA will use the parking lot half of the Owens Adair site for the new building. Perfectly situated in downtown Astoria, Owens 2 addresses the need the city of Astoria has outlined in their comprehensive plan, which recommends that housing for seniors and those with disabilities should be encouraged in Astoria's downtown area so residents can be close to amenities and services. CCA is Clatsop County nonprofit organization whose vision is to help people meet housing, food, and other basic needs. As a culturally responsive organization who provides an open door policy, CCA will provide both residents and supported services for the Owens too. CCA is well situated to provide supported services to the 13 permanent supported housing units and will address clients' needs at the new building. NOAA will own and operate Owens too, which takes advantage of operating efficiencies by the next door by being next door to the existing Owens Dare also owned by and operated by NOAA. NOAA will be able to leverage location efficiencies by allowing property management staff to work exclusively at the Owens Adair and Owens II. Through the insight learned at the Institute, our team has developed an MOU that outlines protocols and procedures around staff collaboration and the communication goals between property management and services staff to achieve our primary goal to keep residents housed. Supportive housing is the calm to ease the storm. We invite you to Owens 2. 50 units will be born. And in these times of trouble, when you feel most alone, our community with open arms brings you home. Our brings you home. Amazing, thank you. That was awesome. I just have a couple questions for you all. Um, and if other people have questions, please put those in the chat. Um, so first of all, how did you select the demographics that you had ch chosen to serve at the Owens 2? Yeah, so we looked uh, very closely at the last publish, uh, published Oregon point in time uh, homeless count in 2019. Um, in that count, it showed that Clatsop County had 894 homeless people per the county's population of uh, 39,330, or a rate of uh, 22.7 people per thousand. Uh, so this statistics is almost double the rate of the next highest county, which is Josephine County. Uh, which has 11.9 people per thousand. We also looked at the 2020 numbers, which show an increase of homelessness of about 12% to over a thousand people in Clatsop County. So the point in time count shows that the amount of homelessness is increasing at an alarming rate, going from 600 people, 680 people in 2017 to over a thousand in 2020, an increase of 47% in just four years. Uh, with the highest per capita rate of homelessness in Oregon, the need to house those that are most vulnerable is, was, a, was apparent to us. 
Um, so the Owens II is a direct response to the needs in the community, achieving a 40% average gross median income for the project. That's amazing, thank you. Um, and then I have one, one other question. Um, how did you select the unit types for Owens II? Yeah, so um, we work closely with Clatsop Community Action to identify and outline plans for services. Um, while we were working with them, it was clear that there was an urgent need for extremely low income housing, uh, particularly for single occupancy units like studios and one bedroom apartments. We also look closely at NOAA's Housing Choice Voucher Program waiting list, uh, which uh, describes this need, and it showed that 82.70% of applicants are 30% AMI, AMI and below, 67.89% are looking for one bedroom unit, 32.4% are elderly households with 5.87% nearing elderly status, and 31.82% of the people on the waiting list are disabled. And again, 69.95% are looking for single occupancy apartments. Great, yeah, it, it sounds like you really use the demographics and what people are needing uh, to really inform the project. That's amazing. Um, thank you all. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat as well. So this was amazing, appreciate it. We will move on to our next team. Uh, Evergreen is up. Okay, I know that sometimes my camera can be a little bit soft. Can you give a thumbs up, Amber? Yep, you're good. You're, you're good. Thanks. Awesome. Well, I didn't know that I was going to be following a musical performance. So when you asked me yesterday if you wanted to change the order, uh, that's a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Erin Day. I'm the director of real estate for Dev Northwest, and I am super excited and really proud to uh, present the Evergreen Project to you all today. Um, this is a church in a parsonage that we are redeveloping into 18 units of long-term housing for veterans. It's located in downtown Salem. Um, so before I even get started, the first time we saw this church in parsonage was back in 2019 when it was on the market. And immediately, immediately, we knew that this was going to be an awesome, affordable home for somebody. We didn't know who it was going to be or what it was going to look like, but we knew we wanted to be part of the process. Um, so we immediately jumped on it. And the first step of this really was to secure the site and to change the zoning. And for those that were following the project, they know that this was a really difficult process. Um, we got a lot of resistance from the community around any type of affordable housing, um, never mind the possibility of permanent supportive housing. Um, we had a lot of education and outreach and engagement with the community. Um, I would say we made some progress, but there's probably more to, to come, um, but it's fine because we're going to be neighbors for a really long time. So hopefully that's plenty of time to build that trust. Um, our land use application did prevail and we were able to secure the site. And so then we were tasked with the hard decision of what to do with this amazing piece of property that we just uh, acquired. And um, so we, we, were, we were going back and forth about which population to serve. We were kind of looking at seniors, maybe vets, um, maybe youth aging out of foster care. And these were really gonna be smaller units, not really family sized units. And this is a really awesome location because it's right next to downtown Salem. So super walkable, close to public transit, but it's also flanked on three sides by a single family home neighborhood called the Grant neighborhood. Um, just super cute and quiet, just really nice neighborhood. And so we were looking for the right population. Um, and so we we did two things. We we first, we looked at the, the funding sources that were available to us to see what our options were. Um, and then we also went out and started talking to service providers in Salem to get a better sense of, kind of who's out there and if anybody has an appetite for working with us. We had some existing partnerships, but we also had a bunch of people we wanted to work with. Um, and, and really it all kind of came together. We, we identified that there were a couple of funding sources for veterans that were gonna work for us. Um, we also uh, we also um, identified, we, we had met with Arches um, who does really amazing work with veterans in Salem um, and they were super on board and it just, the, the relationship just kind of gelled. And so we landed on veterans 
Uh, we applied for the funding, we got the funding, um, and here we are today. Um, we are getting ready to close on this project, hopefully very soon, um, and we're hoping to break ground on this in the next um, month or so. Uh, so just really excited and, and open to any questions that you have. Um, this has definitely been a labor of love, um, but I think well worth it, and it's, it's going to be a really amazing home for these folks um, once it gets built. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do have a couple questions. Um, so the first one, redevelopments, you know, they can be challenging because the developer needs to work within existing conditions and uh, would love if you could speak briefly about how your team balanced the, the existing conditions with the population specific trauma informed design. Yeah, totally. Um, so the church is beautiful. It's a historic church. We definitely wanted to maintain it. Um, and that was also important for like bridging the gap between the new development and the community and the neighborhood. So we really wanted to make sure that we were respecting that, but also building something that was going to work for the population that was going to be living in the site. Um, and so as, as many folks on the call may or may not know, veteran populations, sometimes, sometimes there are issues with sensory um, they're a little bit more sensitive to sounds and noises and uh, light sensitivity and that sort of thing. So we wanted to make sure that as we were going through the design build process, we really approached the design from a resident specific, uh, a resident experience perspective. And so we thought to ourselves, what is it that these residents are going to need to feel healthy and have happy and safe in their homes? And so we worked with like our systems engineers, for example, to try to minimize echoes and door slammings by, by controlling HVAC. Um, we looked at strategic lighting design, we were looking at color palettes and materials and that sort of thing that we knew have kind of an evidence-based uh, impact on, on creating a safe and healthy and happy space for vets. So um, we, it was a challenge, there's no doubt about it, but we, we did our best to try to accommodate it in the design and hopefully it turns out great. Totally. And then, you know, you, speaking about veterans and um, how they have, you know, specific needs, uh, could you talk a little bit more about how you decided to serve veterans and then uh, your relationship with your service provider? Yeah, absolutely. So we we decided to to work with Arches mostly because we we didn't even realize kind of what a gap um, Salem had in long term housing options for veterans. So there were some short term options. Um, 18, 24 months. But after that, it was actually really difficult for these folks to, to find long-term stable housing. Um, and that was just really shocking for us. And, and we wanted to, we, we thought that this project would be a really good connection with some of the other sites that are already existing so that we could create some continuity and some consistency. Um, so not only could um, our arches be involved in the actual service provision, but that we could actually be involved in these in these residents' care and, and home and and sort of life situation from from the time that they they entered into the arches uh, system all the way through for as long as they need the housing. So we just thought that that continuum of care was really important. That's great, thank you, and thanks, Team Evergreen. Uh, appreciate all your work this this last few months. Um, and we actually have two projects from Dev Northwest. So uh, Aaron, if you want to keep going and talk about uh, Polk 2.0. Awesome. So reminder, Aaron, Dev Northwest. Um, so I'm talking about the Polk 2.0 project now, uh, which is a youth aging out of foster care new build. Um, it's located in West Eugene. Um, rewind the clock a little bit because this is a little bit more of a, a, a difficult site to explain. In 2015, NEDCO, which Jeff Northwest is a merged organization, so formerly known as NEDCO, uh, received City of Eugene funding uh, to buy a multifamily property in the WIT, um, which is a neighborhood in West Eugene. And for those of you who don't know the WIT, it's kind of a, a trendy, cool, kind of industrial, artsy neighborhood that's right next to downtown, it's super walkable, um, really vibrant community. Um, and that project in 2015, that multifamily site was, was earmarked to serve uh, youth aging out of the foster care system. So when I say that, I mean kiddos who are now young adults or adults who were somehow um, involved in the foster care system. Um, they weren't ever fully reunified with their biological families, but they also weren't adopted. So when they turned 18 or for in some cases 21, uh, they were kind of on their own to like figure things out. And, and this is a this is a really unique population um, for youth youth. And um, this population in general has some high risk factors for homelessness and some other other psychosocial uh, challenges. And so 
Um, we've been housing this population on this site. Um, and the reason why it's called Polk is because it's on Polk Street in Eugene. Um, and so we've been housing this population for the last five years. Um, and we do all the resident services and all the property management. So needless to say, we have learned a lot in the last five years. Um, one of the biggest lessons that we learned was that there's just not enough housing. Um, we are fully occupied all the time. We have a long wait list. And so one of the first things that we wanted to do was to take the nice big backyard that we have and build a second building. So uh, one of the one of the residents uh, living in Polk actually called it Polk 2.0. So that's what we've called our project. Um, and so it's been our dream for the last several years to create this second this second building um, and to, to really build up an already awesome property into something even more awesome. And so a window of opportunity opened up for us to do that through the small projects NOPA. We also got some funding from the city of Eugene. Um, and so we were able to get this project funded. And so we're here. This project is actually moving on the same timeline as our evergreen project. So we're getting ready to close this and, and break ground uh, in the next month or two. The building itself is what you see in front of you. It's going to be 12 single room occupancy units. So those are like efficiency studio units. Um, it has a community kitchen, a community rec room. It's got a really awesome outdoor recreation area under a pergola. And then we're going to be expanding the already existing pretty active community garden that we have on site now. So um, just super excited to get this one going. Uh, a lot of heart, a lot of time. Um, I can't say I haven't been at Dev Northwest for, uh, I've only been there for three years and this was acquired originally in 2015. So there's a lot of heart that's been put into this way before I joined the team, um, but glad to see it finally coming together. So happy to answer questions. Yeah, that's amazing. You had mentioned some lessons learned and I can imagine uh, from your experience uh, with the, the first Polk, um, a lot of those lessons lessons. Could you just talk, I know you mentioned one, but could you talk about a, some other key lessons learned uh, when designing this uh, Polk 2.0? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the lessons that we took away was the current building has all one bedroom units. And the feedback that we got from current residents and that we were kind of seeing over and over was that that one bedroom unit was a little bit overwhelming for this population. Um, in fact, a lot of the residents would like pull their mattress out and sleep in the front room and like wouldn't even use the back room, um, the bedroom to sleep in. Um, and also to the a lot of the residents gave us the feedback that it was really hard to um, get up the courage to engage in community activities. There wasn't really a lot of community space or support to do that, even though we had an on-site manager. So when we designed the new site, we decided, we decided that we were gonna do SROs instead. Um, so slightly smaller units and then create these larger community spaces that were more welcoming that provided a little bit of additional social infrastructure um, and community infrastructure to help um, kind of bring out that, that part of the living experience for these folks. So that was just one example of, of things that some of the input that we've taken. Totally. Um, and then you had mentioned this one kind of being in the backyard. I'm, I'm just curious, like, how does this development integrate with the rest of the immediate neighborhood and community? Yeah, so as I mentioned, this is kind of a, a really vibrant RC kind of community. And I think one of the things that, you know, we looked at when uh, when we first built or when we first said I like set up the building was we just kind of thought that the community and the building would mesh automatically together just because it's this cool neighborhood and it's this interesting population. And, and we just thought that all that work would just kind of magically happen. And it really didn't. And so um, a lot of the design and a lot of the thought that went into this building has to do with helping both draw the community into the space to be able to provide some uh, opportunities for that engagement, but to also create spaces where the residents can actually do things that would be easier to bring out into the community as well. So um, things like creating this community kitchen. So we do have some residents that participate in the community market, for example, but not many. So um, you know, being able to uh, get neighbors a little bit more involved in the community garden or maybe create something in the kitchen that they can sell in the community market, things like that. So we definitely designed it with the idea of helping to bridge the gap between the site itself and, and meld it a little bit more into this kind of cool community that's around it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat as well. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, yeah, guys. We have an Thanks. Awesome team. I know I'm speaking on behalf of the whole <laughs> team, but everybody is on the call right now. They're all amazing. Uh, thank you for the shout outs for the work that goes unseen because these projects are super tough and 
every single one of the people on this call are just, they're amazing people doing really hard work. So just an extra shout out to them too, because they absolutely, do absolutely. Well, congrats Polk 2.0. Um, and we'll move on to Intrada. Great. Well, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Portland Intrada Project. Let me start by introducing the Intrada Project team. I'm Sean Sue, the Executive Director at New Avenues for Youth. Also with us is Christina Goodman, New Avenues Director of Housing Services, Natara Brown, our project design consultant who has lived experience as a participant in New Avenue's housing programs, Rick Manzardo, the president of the Zeno Group, and finally, Heather Bradley-Geary, the director of sport and housing for the Zeno Group. Now to share a quick bit about New Avenues for Youth. We are a nonprofit dedicated to the prevention and intervention of youth homelessness, offering services that address a wide range of transition age youth needs. We offer everything from basic needs to shelter, mental health, recovery counseling, job training and housing supports. For more than two decades, we've successfully operated a diverse portfolio of site-based and community-based housing programs, including specialized housing for youth aging out of foster care, youth who identify as LGBTQIA 2S+, and youth survivors of sexual exploitation and trafficking. Heather? Thank you so much. Wanted to give you a little bit of information about the Sino Group. Uh, we are a national developer. We're a national supportive housing developer. Uh, so we have 30 supportive housing communities in 14 states. Uh, all of our communities have some kind of a Spanish name because one of our founders is Latina. So Entrada means prelude in Spanish, vecino means neighbor. Uh, so this will actually be our fifth Entrada throughout the country. Um, Entrada Portland will host around 60 units. It's integrated supportive housing. So we'll have 12 units set aside uh, for transition age youth. And with that, I will turn it over to Natara and Christina. Hello everyone, I'm Christina Goodman. I'm the housing director at New Avenues. And we have so many young people that are experiencing houselessness in Portland. They are sleeping right outside my window. Um, there are housing resources, but there's not enough for the need. And there is certainly not enough permanent supportive housing. We definitely need permanent supportive specifically because it provides the stability, the permanent, and the support that these youth have not had and that they deserve and need. I'll pass to you, Natara. So it's my belief that supportive housing is necessary and matters for transition age youth. And the reason is that these services could positively affect this population group the most, benefiting their life more sustainably and impactfully, including the most vulnerable persons among this very vast age group typically suffering from adverse and predatory life experiences, including sex trafficking and exploitation, various forms of um, unsafe environments, mental health crises, and just in general, more debilitating factors that could lead to chronic homelessness later in adulthood. And I'll pass it to you, Rick. Thank you. Hey, I'm Rick from Vecino Group. And our ask is that you invest in the young people of Portland who do not have a place to call home. I mean, as people on this team have just said, and shoot, even Aaron just now from Dev Northwest have attested, this is a greatly underserved community that really needs some resources dedicated to it. So we thank you for your time. If there's extra time, I welcome song requests. I will not be able to do what people before me have done, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> thank you. That was, that was great. Um, love to hear it. So I have a couple questions. Um, and, and please, folks, put some questions in the chat if you have them. So first off, um, why do you want to provide permanent supportive housing for transition age youth? Well, I'll start. Maybe Christina can, can tag team with me. And I'll say you, you heard um, very eloquently from Natara the kinds of harm and, and challenges that some young people face. In the 25 years that New Avenue has been providing services for youth experiencing homelessness, we continue to see young people with severe and persistent barriers, uh, the kinds of barriers that um, permanent supportive housing can, can uh, alleviate and, and help them live, live their best lives. Uh, really, there's, um, there's a significant gap. There's, there's um, permanent supportive housing out there, but very little focus on this population. And there real, there's no reason why young people should have to spend 
much longer periods of time on the streets because there isn't access to a program they need. Christina? Yeah, and I'll definitely add to that, you know, adolescents are still, brain development is still happening. There's still like opportunities for skill building. So really they, they folks need housing and they deserve housing, but they don't just need housing. They need the supportive services that are gonna wrap around them and ensure that they are successful and able to maintain that housing long-term. Absolutely, that's great. Um, and then another piece of that, would love to hear why you're concentrating on integrated supportive housing for, for that population as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can address that just from the developer side of things. Um, we do feel, and from the social work side of things, honestly, uh, for in for all of our communities, actually, at Vecino, we almost never do 100% permanent supportive housing. We usually do integrated supportive housing. And honestly, lots of times market rate units integrated also, along with affordable units. Um, it's really what makes community. And we see that... Um, especially young people succeed more when they're around just all different socioeconomic um, folks that are in their housing. So that that's our goal to do integrated supportive housing. Awesome. Well, you guys are doing amazing work and appreciate you all uh, presenting your project today. This is awesome, congrats. Um, okay, so we will move on to Kafori Court. And I think you're on mute, Andrea. Sorry about that. Good no morning. Worries. Morning. It is still morning, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives is a nonprofit community development corporation that preserves, expands, and manages affordable housing in the city of Portland. Over our 30 year history, uh, PCRI has developed and preserved over 800 units of housing, improving neighborhoods that were once neglected and redlined. Um, these homes ensure safe, stable housing for residents in neighborhoods that are now highly desirable and rapidly gentrifying. Uh, PCRI's presence in North and Northeast Portland has meant that low income people are able to stay in their neighborhood close to jobs, high performing schools and mass transit. Um, the Kafori Court development is a part of PCRI's Pathway 1000 initiative, a long-term solution with corrective measures to mitigate displacement and address systemic barriers causing generational poverty. It creates 1,000 affordable units, housing units, and homeownership opportunities, and uses this vehicle to lift African Americans and low-income residents, address unemployment, underemployment, wage disparities, and racial imbalances. We know that Black residents are at a greater risk of homelessness, which is a culmination of systemic failures in our communities. What's in a name? PCRI has a history of properties named after female, local, and national leaders in the Black community. Maya Angelou, Beatrice Morrow Kennedy, Alberta Simmons, Margaret Carter, Maggie Gibson, and Lydia Roy, to name a few. Kafori Court adds to this rich tradition. The 40 unit permanent supportive housing development is appropriately named after Gretchen Kafori, who was a strong supporter of PCRI, affordable housing advocate, state and local politician, and a teacher of homelessness, poverty, and community development. Kafori Court will work with BIPOC homeless seniors and includes activities offered by two culturally specific agencies in PCRI and the Black community of Portland. We are partner partnering with Northwest Pilot Project who brings expertise in working with senior populations. Northwest Pilot Project or NWPP has been addressing the many needs of very low income seniors in Multnomah County since 1969. NWPP focused on older adults in the downtown core of Portland, providing basic supports for seniors at risk of losing their ability to live independently. NWPP was the only effort providing support for older adults in response. NWPP began to pilot programs in areas of unmet need. Northwest Pilot Project will be providing permanent supportive housing and case management to residents at Kafori Court in which housing assistance and supportive services are provided to assist households with at least one member with a disability 
in achieving housing stability. The Black community of Portland has been voicing the concerns and community of community members since 2015, becoming an incorporated nonprofit with the state of Oregon in 2018. BCP's initiatives were discussed and voted on by its community members to ensure the programming and initiatives were needed and wanted. These initiatives include civic engagement, empowerment through education, wellness and nutrition, and economic development. BCP's participation as a service provider with the Poor Court will include case management for 15 residents, support of housing services, transportation, and mental health services will be provided. Our team is excited to continue to build and uplift the Black community. That's amazing. I love that y'all are um, serving that population. Um, well, I guess I just want to hear a little bit more about why you chose that population to serve. I'll take that on. Um, one of the things many of you may or may not know that, you know, Portland has a long history of displacement um, by way of discriminatory practices and housing that has largely affected the Black community, particularly in North and Northeast Portland. And it continues today. It might look different, but it continues today. Um, our organization is committed to continuing to find solutions to mitigate that displacement. Uh, we know that homelessness among the Black community is a serious issue and growing, and our senior community is among the most volatile. Um, it's a community that is often overlooked and grossly underserved. Um, homelessness also looks different in the Black community. Um, the definition of itself does not uh, entirely reflect the reality of what homelessness looks like for Black residents. Um, so we know the data is already available, and it's great. Uh, so imagine the, the data that we don't have, right? Um, so we have a real accurate picture of what the challenges are. Um, so Kofori Court is our effort to raise the awareness um, and address the need with real intention. Um, the Kofori Court development, you know, will do that and hopefully will be a model um, for opportunities to come. You know, hopefully this is not just the first and the last, but the first of many um, to come. So thank you. Absolutely. That's amazing. I love that. Um, and then I wanted to know what is an element of your design that you're most excited about? Uh, for PCRI, this is our first endeavor into permanent supportive housing. Although uh, with our resident services program, it being so robust, we are already essentially doing support, permanent supportive housing in many of our buildings. Uh, this will just be the one that's the first one that's categorized as permanent supportive housing. We're also very excited about the mix of sunrooms and uh, balconies that you see here on the front facing of the building. And this is gonna be able to promote community for um, folks that are residing at Kafori Court. And they can either in the springtime and the summertime go out and enjoy the weather, but also be shielded from the elements during the other parts of the year where they may not want to be outside, but still want to um, get sunlight. So. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Congrats on this amazing project and appreciate you, your work and serving that population. Uh, you're also getting some love in the chat too. So thank you. Uh, okay. Let's move on to opening doors. Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Masaryk and I am with Evelyn and Company and I am joined by Neil Rotman from Clatsop Behavioral Healthcare and Trisha Hammond from Pinehurst Property Management. Uh, Clatsop Behavioral Healthcare, also known as CBH, provides an array of behavioral health services in Clatsop County. Uh, CBH has witnessed a never-ending cycle in their community of individuals with serious and persistent mental illness, and you'll see that cycle demonstrated on the slide here. So it really starts with a lack of affordable permanent housing uh, that includes support services, which is something we've heard consistently today. Uh, and because of this lack of supply, CBH's clients can't access or retain um, permanent housing, uh, and so they typically move into a shelter or with family. And this move causes uh, increased stress and a decline in their mental status, uh, often leading to hospitalization. From the hospital, individuals enter structured residential placement with uh, Clatsop Behavioral Healthcare uh, to gain some footing. And once they feel stabilized, clients are ready for more permanent independent living 
and there is none, and we're back to square one again. Uh, so to stop this constant revolving door that CBH um, is seeing, they ventured on the path to develop 30 units of permanent supportive housing near the waterfront in Astoria, Oregon. And uh, the picture that's behind that revolving door is the project site. Um, the building will feature community space for tenants, office space for uh, class of behavioral health care, and will house CBH's open door program to help provide services for tenants and also community members. I will pass it over to Neil to provide a personal account of why this project is so important to the community. The Opening Doors project in Astoria is being developed for individuals experience serious and persistent mental illness. Individuals who historically struggle with independent living without on-site support services. In Clatsop County, this population makes up approximately 20% of the houseless population. One of these individuals is Will, a 67-year-old gentleman first diagnosed with schizophrenia back in 1978. For the last 44 years, Will has lived in both group living situations and independently. Unfortunately, he struggled with living independently without a high degree of in-home supports and a community environment that truly accepts him and assists him in being successful. Will has worked hard in his last two group living situations and is now again yearning for, quote, a place of his own. Somewhere he can cook and bake his favorite foods, entertain his friends and family, and enjoy his favorite activities. However, Will is aware he still needs support to maintain independently in an apartment. Support with making and keeping his appointments, grocery shopping, his personal hygiene, and attending services and supports that keep him connected to his treatment programs and recovery activities. Will loves the idea of living in an apartment complex that is a community of individuals dealing with similar behavioral health issues that he himself experiences at times. Quote, my own apartment in a building with people who understand the difficulties I have and still don't think I'm just a loony, that's a dream come true. Just hope I live long enough to see it happen. Will, we all want to make this happen for you and your peers. Amazing. I love the story. Appreciate uh, having that perspective. Um, so just wanted to know kind of why do you think that permanent supportive housing is a good fit for your target population? Individuals with serious and persistent mental illness have symptoms that fluctuate. And as such, their support needs need to fluctuate. A good PSH project provides supports and services that meet those changing needs, allowing for the tenant to receive more support or less depending on how they are managing their symptoms and their recovery. PSH is an individualized approach that yields the best long-term outcomes for the SPMI, SPMI population. Um, and from my perspective, they would be drastically less homeless SPMI individuals if we could provide unlimited PSH apartment projects. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Neil. Um, and then uh, also wanted to know how you will provide comprehensive services in this location. Thanks for asking that question. Um, in the development plan for the building, we want to co-locate our ACT program, Assertive Community Treatment, and our Community Support Services program, programs that currently provide outreach and support to the SPMI population. Some of the building's residents may be eligible and enrolled in these programs if they so choose, which will increase the likeliness of active engagement. Together with dedicated in-house support staff to include peer mentors, CBH believes that these supports will ensure all residents have the individualized services and supports to assist them in being successfully housed. In addition, CBH has a clinic about five blocks away that offers substance use disorder treatment and rapid access for resident requires an immediate assessment and formal mental health services. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for all the work that you're doing for serving that population. Appreciate it. Um, and congrats, team Opening Doors. Okay, moving on to Third Street Commons. Can you hear us clearly today? Yep, you sound good. So I'm Hezekiah from Third Street Commons. I've also been homeless for 21 years in my life up until getting the residential assistant position here at Third Street Commons. 
So I've been on both sides of the fence and still live with the anxiety that home can be swept away at any moment. I prepare a poem for today. In this garden, we are cultivating each seed when given adequate soil, sun, and proper environment are bound to grow. I have seen severely damaged plants with severed roots when transplanted, flourish within a short period of time with supports and structures. Without this period of germination, these seeds sprout in hostile pastures, maladapted. I have seen what most people take for granted and bring a once wilted flower back to life. The equivalent of not having a home is a seed with no soil for roots to take place. Thank you so much, Hezekiah. I'm Andrea Myrie. I'm the executive director of Corvallis Housing First. The mission of Corvallis Housing First is to provide solutions to homelessness and self-sufficiency. We currently operate 42 units of supportive housing in Corvallis, serving people who have experienced homelessness, many of whom have been chronically homeless. We provide case management services to people in our housing and at our local shelters and drop-in center with a focus on getting people into housing. Third Street Commons, our PSH project site, formerly a 50s style motel that includes a bare lot, was purchased through Project Turnkey in 2021. We quick, quickly realized that the property would be an ideal site for developing PSH units that would be healthy, accessible, and inclusive, uh, and a place where we could offer on-site mental health support and other key services. Since then, we have raised $8 million in capital funding and are starting a design process this month, including the voices of residents already living at the site, partners and neighbors as we go. And I'll pass it to you, Anita. Thanks, Andrea. Hello, my name is Anita Earl, and I'm a social worker and complex care manager in the Samaritan Health Services System. I work in Corvallis, the town where this project will be initiated, and we're a tight-knit community of people constantly working together to support those in deep need. The Samaritan and county healthcare systems are aligned with the idea that housing is healthcare. And in our efforts to address social determinants of health, we're very grateful to partner with CHF. Our rapport is long established and collegial, but most importantly, we have a shared vision of providing shelter, kindness, and easy access to healthcare. Through our combined efforts, we're hoping to maximize opportunities for sheltering some of the most marginalized folks in our community. As a dear houseless friend recently told me, the most potent four letter word in the English language is home. And that's what we're hoping to offer at the Commons. Thanks for listening. Amazing, thank you all. Hez, I love your poem, it's awesome. I get chills every time. Um, I uh, just have a couple questions. Uh, Anita, you had mentioned about um, the the community and serving those those folks that are um, vulnerable. Just wanted to ask, um, how does this project help address homelessness in Corvallis in that area? So I can answer that question. We know through a recent analysis of local data that between 150 and 200 people are in need of supportive housing at any one time in, in our community. So through, um, even though we operate uh, supportive housing, we still have a long way to go in meeting our needs um, locally. Um, and permanent supportive housing is a new concept in Corvallis. So a further demographic um, study of this data revealed that people of color are experiencing homelessness more often in our community so for example, our, even though our local census data indicates that um, Native American Native American population of our county is less than 1%, um, over 12% of the local homeless population identifies as Native American. Also, many report struggling with trauma, mental health, and physical challenges. This new development would allow us to address those issues through appropriate design and make available space for additional services. That's great. Um, and then the other question I had was, uh, how do you intend to really um, tie that rent support with the units in this project? So we have a great deal of support from local partners and other programs to help provide ongoing rent in our other housing. However, we are hoping to attract rent support through a grant proposal to OHCS, um, as well as contracts with um, local health care and county behavioral health. 
Um, we are talking with our local housing authority who are working on, on a process of participating in a place-based vouchering um, program. As a community, providers have collaborated, collaborated, collaborated together with us to help uh, make this project, project a success. However, more opportunities in our state to access rent and services funding for people in need of supportive housing will ensure permanency and support our ongoing efforts to end homelessness in our community. Absolutely. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, appreciate all you, your effort and your wonderful presentation. Um, thank you all. Congrats. Okay. L last but certainly not least, uh, Blackberry Hill. Hello, everyone. My name is Sheila Stiley. I'm the executive director of Northwest Coastal Housing, a nonprofit affordable housing development agency based here in Lincoln County. We're excited to share our project with you, affectionately named Blackberry Hill Apartments. It's an 11 unit single bedroom veteran complex with three permanent supportive housing units to be developed in the secluded area in Toledo, Oregon, a small community approximately seven miles east of Newport on the beautiful Oregon coast in Lincoln County. Our goal of a veteran housing complex is to promote a peer, a peer supported structure for homeless veterans who suffer from post war traumas. Historically, a housing shortage was a, has existed throughout all of Lincoln County. And that shortage has been exacerbated by the worldwide health crisis and the natural disaster of the wildfires. Without sufficient affordable housing resources and with the county rental vacancy rate of less than 0.05%, these individuals often remain homeless and cycle through the county jail or hospital emergency rooms as verified by the 2019 point in time count. Veterans tend to live in rural areas, and the Lincoln County Veteran Service Officer reported that Lincoln County's veteran population at 10.7% is higher than the total state of Oregon at 7%. Lincoln County Veterans Resource Center maintains that one of the largest hurdles for local veterans is the extreme lack of housing supply and has identified the lack of capacity to address health and, some need and home needs as a serious limitation to serving veterans. Limited housing availab availability is a persistent barrier to access and integration of care. As a matter of fact, a local veteran injured his back at the lumber yard and he lost his job, his housing due to the injury. He actually lived in Toledo for his entire life and asking him to move away from his family supports and doctors was going to be a monumental task. Well, he was forced to move out of Lincoln County due to the lack of supportive housing. This veteran had never used or asked for resources and having guided supportive housing could have changed his story. It took around five years to connect him to resources. When asked, do you think the journey would have been different if you had had supportive housing in Toledo? His response was yes. I would not have felt so isolated from my community and family. I would have had access to services sooner and could have relied on my community to help me. Well, we're here to make real change with a real building saturated in services, and we could not do it without the support of our funders and our partners that include the Community Services Consortium, the Housing Development Center, Pinehurst Management, Lincoln County Veteran Services Resource Center, Lincoln County Behavioral Mental Health, our architect Capri Architecture, as well as our contractor Miley Construction. We're excited and looking to break ground in late spring of 2023. These will be the first of what we hope to be many permanent supportive housing units in Lincoln County. Amazing. I really appreciate the context of that story that really helped drive the purpose uh, home on this project. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you had mentioned that it was in a remote area and that veterans tend to live in, um, in remote areas. But if you could talk a little bit more about why you would build um, in such a secluded space? Well, that's where veterans are and that's where they want to be. <clears throat> veterans like being part of small communities after exiting the military where they feel like they can make a difference in their community and their contribution will be valued. Yep, that's awesome. Um, and then lastly, um, how do you envision seeing like services meshing together for uh, positive outcomes for, for those veterans? 
So living in the rural areas, um, we don't have the traditional access to resources that would be ava available to more the metro and, and urban or urban metro and rural areas. So we have to be really creative about how we address some of those services and those needs, um, just because we're so far removed from the remainder of of the of, of our rural and rural metro partners. So and those services that are there. Some of us actually go back to serving together for almost 20 years or more. And it's, it's important that we continue that process. We're always being creative. We're always thinking about getting around those barriers. When there's a closed door, we're looking for an open window. And that's just what we do and how we think and how we strive. And nothing has changed in regards to this project. We really have worked together to try and ensure that these barriers that could be met, that we've alleviated them for the successful outcome come for these veterans and we're really excited to do so. Awesome. Thank you all. This is a great project. I appreciate you serving that that population and all the work that you do. Um, congratulations as well. Thank you. That is it for us. I don't I know we're we're close to time so I'm not sure we have time for any other questions um, but appreciate everybody being on and and listening intently. Yeah, thank you guys so much for attending today. Um, we talked about in the beginning, community building, y'all participated today in that. So thank you so much and awesome work to the teams. That was really, 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 really exciting. Thanks guys, see y'all. Yeah, congrats everyone, appreciate you.